Welcome everyone. We'll uh, just wait a couple minutes to let the audience slide on to Zoom for today's se seminar. Uh, we'll just be getting started in a minute or two. Once again, uh, welcome everyone. Thanks for joining us today. We'll uh, just wait a minute or two for everybody to sign on. All right. All right. So, uh, welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Ira Guberman. I'm the manager of programming and operations here at ISGAP, the Institute for the Study of Global Anti-Semitism and Policy. Uh, on many Thursdays throughout the next several months this spring, we'll be hosting a uh, seminars over Zoom as part of our anti-Semitism in South Asia and Comparative Perspective Seminar Series. Uh, apologies for the siren coming through. Um, today, we're honored to have uh, Fawaz Javad joining us. Uh, he's a lecturer in Pakistan Studies at Kohat University of Science and Technology. Um, I'll be telling everyone further information about upcoming events towards the end of today's event, but you can always uh, follow us over social media on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And uh, you can always visit our website, isgap.org to uh, watch recordings of these sessions and uh, see upcoming events. At this time, I'll hand things off to our convener, Dr. Navraz Afridi. Thank you, Mr. Gubuman. Welcome to the fifth session of the webinar series, Anti-Semitism in South Asia in a Comparative Perspective. I'm Navra Safridi, a research fellow at the Institute for the Study of Global Anti-Semitism and Policy and the convener of the series. We are very privileged to have with us Professor Fawad Javed today. It is, he would be speaking on anti-Semitism in Northwest Pakistan and Afghanistan. And we are gratefully conscious of how courageous it is for him to do so while he sits in Pakistan and speaks on this subject. He is not only a Pakistani, but is also geographically located there. So it uh, is a, a display of great courage to speak on us on a subject of this nature from there. He is a lecturer in Pakistan studies at the Kohat University of Science and Technology and a scholar of uh, American studies and South Asian studies. He has also taught at the University of Peshawar and COMSATS University Islamabad. That's an acronym, COMSATS. He has published in Pakistan's premier peer reviewed journals such as Pakistan Journal of American Studies and the Pakistan Development Review. He is a fellow 
of Salzburg Global Seminar since 2010 and has participated in several of its sessions held in 2010, 2014, 2016, and 2017 on promoting Holocaust education and countering extremism. Since 2018, he is engaged in our United States Holocaust Memorial Museum research project on the Holocaust impressions of Indo-Pakistani army personnel fighting on the Western Front during the Second World War. War and peace studies and North American labor history are his key research areas. Uh, he shall speak to you for about 30 or 40 minutes, after which we shall open the floor for questions. He would be kind enough to answer the questions. You are requested to post your questions in the comment box. Now, without any further ado, I warmly welcome my friend and colleague, Mr. Fabad Javed, to deliver his lecture. Uh, Fabad, the floor is all yours now. Thank you very much for agreeing to speak for us under the series. Thank you very much, Norris. Thank you very much, friends at ISGAP for uh, honoring me with uh, this opportunity to deliver a talk on this very important topic. We are living in the times of great opportunities and uh, the sooner we realize that the better for us. This morning, I'm going to talk to you about how to counter anti-Semitism in Northwest Pakistan and Afghanistan. I plan to divide this presentation in three sections. In the first section, I shall introduce the place to you. And in the second uh, section of the presentation, I shall talk about uh, the incidence of anti-Semitism in, uh, in the, this geography about which we are talking. And in the third phase, we shall primarily and uh, focus on how to counter anti-Semitism in this place. Now, speaking of Northwest Pakistan and Afghanistan, let me mention here with uh, some pride that uh, this has been a culturally very, very diverse area for at least two millennia. It is a place that lies between the river Oxus, which divides the Uzbekistan country for, and Afghanistan, and the river Indus, which flows through Pakistan. So in the Northwest, we have the Oxus River, and in the Southeast, we have the river Indus. Then in the Northeast, we have the Pamir Ranges, which run through the Central Asian country of Kyrgyzstan. And in the Southwest, we have the Great Iranian Plateau. We are talking about 34 provinces of the country called Afghanistan. And then we are talking about 35 districts of Pakistani provinces of Khyber Pakhtunkhwa and Balochistan. And then we are talking about nine more districts of Balochistan. If this description, if this account is a little complicated, I would just present a map here. So the Afghanistan is very clearly visible and I have drawn a red line to show the Pakistani areas about which we are talking. If we move to our slide number four, we shall uh, see that uh, this whole place was historically diverse in that, that uh, it was the gateway to the great Indo-Pakistan subcontinent and uh, whosoever came to India from the interior of Asia or even from the Western European countries as far as uh, say Germany or even Russia, they had to travel to this path and the great Silk Road's uh, southeastern branch moved through these areas. Now, most people in this place have not seen Jewish person in their lives. This is the case today. Much of the information about the Jewish people come to the common masses through 
three diverse sources. Number one, academics, especially the academics uh, who deal with religious matters. So religious scholarship are really is one source of information about the Jewish people for the common masses. Then there is the media. The media too talks a lot about Jewish people. This was mostly the case uh, when the current prime minister of Pakistan, Imran Khan became uh, the country's prime minister. And he, his uh, earlier Jewish wife and his in-laws, uh, the Goldsmith family of Britain, they became a, a subject of scrutiny in the Pakistani media for quite some time. And then the knowledge of Jewish people also comes uh, from uh, the internet sources in more recent times. But these sources of information for the common masses about the Jewish people are problematic. They are problematic in that, that uh, most of the people who control them are not friendly towards the Jewish people. Now, if we talk about the religious sources, we can point out the fact that uh, the Islamic religion, which is practiced in Pakistan and in Afghanistan, its primary sources are not in the local languages. You know, it is in Arabic. So none of these people understand the primary sources for Islam and uh, whatever knowledge of Islam comes to them, uh, come th uh, it comes through the translations done by certain clerics. Whosoever controls those clerics, they get uh, some kind of handle on uh, the religious public opinion in this whole place. And if we look up the historical trend over the past four decades, we know that uh, this uh, religious clergy, which controls opinion, religious opinion at the grassroots level is not uh, ethically very, very strong in that, that tra their translations and interpretations of the religious sources are mostly maneuvered and manipulated in the interest of whosoever holds power in the region. I can refer to the two military regimes of Pakistan's uh, relatively recent history. And uh, through these two regimes, the clerics of the area try to interpret Islam according to the demands of the government in power. During General Zia's era, it was, uh, it was a demand, a political demand from the ruling authorities that uh, an extremist version of Islam should be encouraged and it should be practiced and followed. So the clergy, they went to great efforts to interpret Islam according to the political situation of the times. Then during General Parvez Musharraf time, the political situation changed totally. So the same clerics who were earlier presenting one version of Islam, which was an extreme one, switched over and decided to present a totally different version of Islam. So how do you encourage these clerics to get uh, friendlier towards the Jewish people? This is something we, we shall have to look into. And uh, from my experience with so many clerics over the past six, seven years, this is even over the past four years, I am especially being kept in a religious atmosphere to change my views. My department, which is the Department of Pakistan Studies, it has been merged with the Islamic Studies Department so that I have a mo more proximity with the clerics and uh, I can become more religious. So I have got some considerable know-how with them. And then I have been meeting a couple of ex-Talibans. So what, what's the, the key learning I have made is that they can be, they can be maneuvered, they can be managed, especially the second to third tier of the clerics, it is manageable. What's important is that uh, the top leadership, they, they need to be rather, uh, you know, more actively convinced to change their lines. Then we have the media, the electronic and print media, which uh, to 
goes a long way in shaping religious opinions and uh, on subjects like the Jewish question. The Pakistani media over the past 15 to 16 years has gradually slipped into the control of uh, what, how should I put it, uh, the Iranian interests within Pakistan. And uh, in this uh, regard, the primary role has been played by three major political actors. The Parvez Musharraf regime, which was a military dictatorship that ruled from 1999 to 2008. And then the Pakistan People's Party, which was Benazir Bhutto's party. But after her demise, it went into some really wrong hands and they too started playing in the Iranian hands. And in Northwest Pakistan, the ANP, Awami National Party, since it was at uh, loggerheads with the Taliban Sunni extremists, they didn't have any protection. So they decided to come to some kind of understanding with the Iranian interests within the region. And this all meant that the Pakistani media, print media, if I refer to two, these two major English dailies, Daily Dawn and Daily News, it has gradually slipped into the hands of uh, people who could not be very friendly to the Jewish people. Now, we have to form some counter, strong counter narratives to what uh, this kind of media peddles about the Jewish people in the society at large. Speaking of Afghanistan and uh, people's perception about the Jewish people in Afghanistan too provides a very interesting, in fact, a more interesting picture. And in Afghanistan, we can divide the country into four major cultural zones. And speaking of which, we can uh, say that uh, there is the friendly Uzbek, Central Asian, Turkic provinces of Afghanistan. This is an area where opinion about the Jewish people is friendly. They are the Uzbek community of Afghanistan and uh, they share some good cultural proximity and interactions with the Uzbekistan, Uzbekistan country of Central Asia. These people, you know, we often hear about the word Bukharan Jews. Bukhara is a place in Uzbekistan. And the trading culture, the trading economy of Uzbekistan was once uh, one where the Jewish Bukharan Jewish people played a significant part. Even, in fact, even as of today, the only Jewish person left in Afghanistan is a trader, and he seems to have enjoyed some good relations with the Uzbek community of Afghanistan. Then the second uh, major uh, cultural region we should be talking about uh, in terms of attitudes towards uh, the Jewish people is uh, the Persianized Dari provinces of Afghanistan. They are the Tajik provinces of Afghanistan who share a common culture with the Central Asian country of Tajikistan. And they are Sunni in uh, religious practice. And their attitude towards uh, the Jewish people would be from ambivalent to hostile because culturally they are Persianized, closer to Iran and Tajikistan. But in religious practice, they are Sunnis. So they would be ambivalent, like they won't be either very hostile or friendly towards the uh, Jewish people. Then we have the religiously hostile Mongol Hazara provinces of Pakistan. They are a tiny minority. They won't display an overt anti-Semitism, but if you scratch a bit and if you like uh, do some investigation uh, about the perceptions about various faiths, they would, they would often come up with the replies that Jews are the biggest enemies of Islam and Muslims, and they would peddle this conspiracy theories about 9-11 being done by the Jewish and uh, Israel is out to occupy the whole of the Middle East. These kind of narratives are common among them. And then finally, we have the Pashtun areas, which is the largest demographically and geographically the largest part of uh, the country, but which uh, in terms of uh, culture, are backward. There are 16 
Pashtun dominated provinces in Afghanistan. And uh, these provinces, they are up for grabs, so to speak, in terms of uh, building good opinions uh, about the Jewish people. They are rural, they are rustic, and they don't have a well-developed education system. And their backwardness and uh, the fact that they haven't yet been exposed to many of the more developed political or cultural currents in the rest of the regional countries or the Muslim world at large means that uh, with proper uh, public relationing, good opinion about the Jewish people can be built in these 16 provinces of Afghanistan. We are at slide number seven, I hope. So then uh, we have 45 districts in Pakistan, which are uh, uh, where the Pashtun people live. And uh, out of these 45 uh, districts, nine districts lie in the Balochistan province of uh, Pakistan. And of these uh, 35 districts lie in the Khyber Pakhtunkhwa province of Pakistan. Now, when uh, we speak about these two provinces, let's, let me remind you that historically, these provinces have not had a major say in the political or cultural uh, life of Pakistan. It was only after the advent of the Cold War in the late 1970s that these two provinces got unusual importance. Many people were recruited in the army, which meant that they started exercising unusually big power in the polity and their culture started having a bigger uh, say in the overall cultural milieu of the whole country. Now their opinion matters a lot in deciding uh, the political currents in the country, so much so that the current prime minister, Imran Khan, he is a uh, Pashtun by ethnicity, even though he cannot speak uh, any of the uh, Pashto languages spoken in either in Afghanistan or in Pakistan, but by his tribe, the Niazis, they are Pashtuns. And uh, this would mean that uh, whatever transpires culturally in the provinces of Khyber Pakhtunkhwa and Balochistan would not only be monitored, but noticed by the Pakistani state. Pakistani army is increasingly having a better and better relationship with the Pashtuns. But this relationship, this newfound love for uh, the Pashtun is conditional. I can say this from my experiences because once I was noticed to be doing something they did not like, right? And uh, first they conveyed it to me in a mild manner when they noticed that uh, I'm not exactly towing the line they started uh, surveilling my contacts. And instead of uh, like earlier days, in earlier days, maybe I would have been a displaced person, but in the current times, they don't want to antagonize us further. And in the current times, they more of this try to manage us rather than coerce us to uh, very strong armed measures. So the opinion in these areas about the Jewish people can be molded uh, by better engagement with the masses, with the common people. And that can happen through two sources. In Pakistani part of the Pashtun world or the Northwest of Pakistan areas, the electronic media mostly employs the Urdu language. But the interesting part is that many of uh, us, the Pashtun people, find it uh, a little difficult to pronounce Urdu correctly. And uh, Pashto media, which uh, most of the people would understand comfortably is not very well developed. So in this undeveloped Pashto media, if we try to do some investment and uh, toss up a few uh, trends, they would, they would soon become very popular if uh, done in a culturally sensitive manner. And it is in this area that we can, uh, we can uh, 
create an opportunity for creating a good image for the Jewish people in uh, this Pashtun media. And then alongside that, we should realize that throughout the region, the central problem for the Jewish people is that uh, their image has been uh, misrepresented. And this uh, wrong presentation of the Jewish people has been done by non-locals because the locals neither have much control over the religious culture of the area nor the media culture of the area. As local elements become more assertive in religious matters in uh, Afghanistan and in Pashtun areas of Pakistan, they would, they would definitely want to be friendly towards everyone because their experience with the hate mongering tendencies has been a devastating one. By now, we have learned our lessons. Even the common child you come across on the streets of Peshawar bazaars know that war is bad and it brings ruining of families. And even they realize that hating someone creates wars. If they are convinced that yes, there are people in this world who share some kind of genealogy with you and who are interested in having good partnership at cultural levels, at developmental levels with you. And they want you to see them in more positive lights and they want to develop you. They are going to turn very good friends of the Jewish people. Now, let's, let's move to slide number eight countering anti-Semitism in Afghanistan and Northwest Pakistan. Now, we should trust to the fact that we are increasingly living in the age of extraordinary possibilities. And this uh, diffusion of information to the remotest corners of the world, through the internet, through communication tools such as the WhatsApp means that uh, everybody can present his and her case in uh, the clearest manner to everybody else. The middlemen, the manipulators, their space is increasingly shrinking. If somebody comes to a boy, say in the Hazara region of Afghanistan, an adolescent telling him that Jews are your enemies, before becoming an enemy of the Jewish people, he would first want to look up the Jewish people through the internet. And then if somebody comes to a person telling him that uh, it's your responsibility to fight against this or that country or this or that uh, faith before picking up arms or deciding that he wants to go to heaven uh, and for that he needs to fight, he would try to research it first this is this is one of the key trend of our times this is something i have noticed among my own students and i've been teaching in this place for the past six years they come from rural alpine mountainous backward areas but they have some good connectivity and this means that they have access to information and the key learning is that wherever people get a uh, uh, good access to sound information uh, in a healthy manner, their opinions, their opinions are mostly friendly towards everybody else. So what we can do is that we shall have a comprehensive strategy for uh, dealing with the anti-Semitic uh, trend, not only in Afghanistan and West Pakistan, West Pakistan and Northwest Pakistan and Afghanistan could be just one starting point and uh, we can learn our lessons from our experiences in this place. We need to have a good wholesome strategy for uh, beating anti-Semitism in uh, all the 57 countries that are members of the Organization of Islamic Conference. And for that, we should start with less controversial durable targets. Now, when I say less controversial, it means that uh, when uh, we talk about the Jewish people in Muslim, world to anyone, we should uh, start with that the Jewish people have suffered and they want to be friends to everyone. This is the least controversial line. After this line, even if uh, the cleric comes to them, telling them that uh, this uh, 
the Holy Quran says this thing about uh, Jewish people are religious opinion has to be negated to uh, about the Jewish people. The people wouldn't buy it easily. Then doable targets. When we speak about doable targets, we we should uh, start with uh, say colleges and universities. We should start with the uh, social media. We should start with uh, dealing with the uh, the wrong narratives that might come up uh, come up in the uh, anti-Semitic uh, local print media. These are few things that are achievable that can be done relatively easily. Once the, this impact grows, we can move on to cost a bigger uh, bigger influence on the opinion in the whole place. Then we should also know that uh, who are the enemies and who are the foes uh, of the Jewish people in the whole place and why are they doing it? After all, people, when they talk hate, when they promote uh, hostility towards somebody, they, they don't do it uh, uh, for uh, say purely ideological reasons, this is what I have learned in my place. It is all my, at the end of the day, there is always a material interest. Even as of today, we have a leading cleric in Pakistan talking anti Semitism as he tries to uh, wage a moment against Prime Minister Imran Khan. And it was the same cleric who took uh, a softer line on the Jewish people some uh, six years back. Uh, when uh, his interests suited him. I'm talking about Maulana Fazlur Rahman. And uh, this means that given material interests, clerics, people change their lines in the media. This is true of both politicians as well as what passes for intelligentsia. Then uh, we should identify the hostile characters in the media and the rest of the civil society. Speaking of media, this uh, gradual imperceptible control of uh, the Pakistani media and bureaucracy by the Iranian interests within Pakistan has been a trend at least since 2005. And uh, this trend, you know, it should be changed and it should be like, uh, you know, converted into something healthier without upsetting too much of our Pakistani relations with the Iranians, but we should convey it to them that look, we have already had enough of troubles because of these hate narratives in the place and we simply cannot afford to be enemies with anyone. Then we need to build better organized networks of reliable people who have a sense of the Jewish history and their current situation. And when I say reliable people, I say this because uh, I have witnessed uh, another trend in this place over the past decade and half or even more. And uh, I would refer to it in the next slide. Can you please go to the ninth slide? So, now, yeah, the, the slide before it, excuse me. So we should try to enhance contact through frequent interactions. We should try to do some good socio-cultural analysis of the regions where you want to improve the image and both build good ties. And we should disseminate information and cultural material about the Jewish people according to the cultural landscape of the regions. And we should build strategies and tools to connect directly with the common people. Now, these four points, they need some elaboration in that, that uh, Pakistani academia and Pakistani bureaucracy in the Northwest Pakistan has uh, increasingly been invaded by uh, undesirable characters due to the war on terrorism, because the most learned one and uh, the intellectually most gifted ones, they decided not to take a very active part in the political fray because as it entailed uh, involvement in sleazy transactions, sleazy uh, cultural manipulation. And as they receded into the background, very opportunistic and uh, the wrong type of characters, intellectual nobodies, hacks, frauds, they started 
occupying places in the academia and in the bureaucracy. And now they, are, they have become so strong that wherever they see a trend which uh, they, don't disapprove, they don't approve of, they try to manipulate the whole system against uh, the people who are encouraging uh, uh, the trends which they, they, they feel threatened with. And uh, I would refer to so many academics who have very long CVs and uh, who claim that they have published this or that article. But when you discuss uh, the subject areas of their own research with them, you learn that perhaps they are fakes. They haven't read the books or the articles they claim to be discussing and uh, they are arguing over. So we have to be very, very watchful about such characters as we devise uh, uh, me measures and instruments for countering anti-Semitism in Northwest Pakistan. Again, in Afghanistan, the academia is still in the nascent stage. Some three months back, I got a chance to interact with the uh, Afghanistan academics uh, who had come to Islamabad from uh, Kabul on a three days visit. And I learned uh, that most of them could only speak either uh, Pashto or Dari. And uh, the readings they had done on uh, religious subjects, on sociology or literature were only the ones that were written either in Persian or in Pashto. So a reading done in Persian means that the Iranians would have a very big uh, impact on their perceptions. Readings done in Pashto would mean that uh, the ex-Talibans would have a stronghold on their opinions. We have to produce some more cultural uh, material in the two languages that is friendlier towards the Jewish people and that can project uh, the Jewish people in the correct perspective within this society. Can we please move to the next slide? Now, an educated and informed image building exercise for the Jewish people is needed in the whole of the Muslim world. This is something I have realized over the past six years because I have friends in Afghanistan, I have friends uh, in Pakistan and uh, I have had some contact with the uh, Arab friends who otherwise are very, very friendly to me and uh, who see me as a good company. But the moment this Jewish question comes up, we soon realize that we have some differences of opinion. And this means that uh, the Muslim Arabs and the non-Muslim Arabs together shall have to arrive at some kind of consensus on how to interact with the Jewish people in a very wholesome and healthy manner. And this process requires that nobody's ideas and nobody's opinions should be excluded because wherever you exclude people, you create troubles for yourself in the times to come. Now, we can build a narrative. We can, for starters, we can build a narrative about the Jewish people, which would be, which can become potentially come, become very popular among the Muslims of the 57 or so countries. And the starting point of that narrative can be that Jews have suffered more than any other people in history over the past three millennia. This requires reading non-religious history as well. And alongside the religious history with which most of us, uh, uh, to which most of us are uh, exposed early on, we, it is important to go for some secular and non-religious uh, history reading as well. Then we should also note that the Jewish people did not succumb to the sufferings uh, which they suffered and they made a comeback. Now this comeback message can resonate with masses in Afghanistan, in my Northwestern Pakistan area with people in Iraq, Libya, and uh, all the countries they, where the Muslim perception is that uh, people are suffering and uh, perhaps all hope is lost. We can learn from the Jewish experience and uh, we can also hope to make a comeback. Then we can also encourage uh, a perception that uh, sees the Jews as enterprising people who develop others in developmental undertakings. 
and uh, we can point out uh, the fact that even though uh, the Jewish people had to live in uh, an agriculturally less promising area, despite that, they have managed to uh, solve their food security problems in a very effective manner. That's where they can help with the uh, agriculture systems in the Muslim countries and places like Northwest Pakistan or the Balochistan province of Pakistan. Then we should also try to convince Muslims across the world that Jews are not the enemies of Islam. And in our modern times, uh, common grounds can be found and they have to be found if we have to live in perpetual peace. So Jews are not the enemies of Islam and Muslims. This is, this is a line which can become very popular with the Muslims across the world. Then at ethical level, if you look at the spirit of Islam, dehumanizing any people is un-Islamic. And that importantly uh, is true of the Jewish people with whom the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, signed a Misak. Yes, that Misak didn't end well, but that can be taken as a lesson to follow in our modern times where all cultures, all societies have to shed uh, uh, religious or cultural baggage that creates uh, international problems or interregional problems. Then among the Pashtuns, there is a perception that, I, I mean, Norris might not totally agree with us, but there is a perception among the Pashtun people that perhaps the Pashtuns and the Jewish people enjoy, uh, they, they have, they share a common genealogy. Now, the Lost Tribes uh, argument is there and his, his historical veracity is uh, suspected, but then given a tribal people, my Pashtun people, would uh, respond to that kind of argument. If we encourage that argument among the Pashtuns, they would want to be friendlier towards the Jewish people. Can we please move to the next slide? Yes, conclusion. So we all know that a journey of thousand miles begins with a step. And this step in our modern times is uh, has to be a step of cooperation, respect for diversity and pluralism. And these are the values we shall have to espouse if we have to survive as a species. Because in the age of mass diffusion of knowledge, both constructive as well as destructive, making enemies is not a good option for anyone. And it would just be a matter of time when knowledge of some of the most destructive uh, elements would uh, reach everywhere. So at that point, it would only be this uh, culture of brotherhood and respect for human life and respect for all people that shall ensure uh, that uh, nobody harms any everybody else uh, in a huge and big way. And the three Abrahamic religions they shall have to take the initial steps towards building that kind of pluralistic global culture where Muslims learn to respect Jews and Jews respect to learn Muslims and world peace thrives and prevails in a good, good planet Earth. I thank you. And uh, now I declare the floor open for discussion. Thanks a lot, Fabad, for this great analysis. We have four questions from Andrea Spindle. She is the academic executive director of the Canadian Anti-Semitism Education Foundation. Her first question is, since there are no Jews in Pakistan and Afghanistan, who is there to run a campaign to change minds about Jews? On whose interest would it be deemed worthwhile? Okay, this is, this is an excellent question. Now, may I tell you that uh, although there are no Jewish people in uh, Pakistan uh, in a significant manner, but my Neskal and very tiny Jewish uh, population does exist. And maybe around 700 to 800 uh, voters who voted in the 
last Pakistani elections in 2018 uh, claimed that they were Jewish. Now it is important for them that the Muslims uh, of Pakistan learn to be more respectful towards the Jewish people. Who would run the campaign for uh, about uh, for Jews, people like us, the progressive elements of the society and in the academia, because it is in their interest that countries and people learn to live peacefully. And uh, we, should, we shall be in the vanguard of uh, such campaigns. Let me assure you, I have a network of my own and uh, who are like-minded people, some of us, uh, are religious, others are uh, totally agnostic, but we see that it is important for uh, all people and all faiths to live in a live peacefully in a pluralistic uh, culture. Yeah. I hope second this answers question. the question. Yes, her second question is: since many, if not most, Pashtuns know they have an Israelite history, what is the rationale for the Jew hatred? Yeah, this is this is a formidable and this is a very interesting question because uh, it touches uh, the kind of religious theology taught uh, in uh, Northwest Pakistan and Southeast Afghanistan or the Shia Afghanistan in particular. And uh, this uh, theology comes uh, loaded against uh, the Jewish people wherein, uh, you know, there are these three lines. These three lines are that uh, there is a possibility that the Jews are eternally damned. This is, this is a theology which is taught in certain sections. And since God doesn't like Jews, they always suffered and they are still suffering because God doesn't like them. Now, logically and ethically, this argument is very problematic because it is very, very ungodly to damn or curse somebody permanently. No real God would do that. And uh, this is this is a line which Pashtuns would buy if given uh, if it is peddled very intelligently and very effectively. The rationale for Jew hatred wherever it exists is religious. No, this Palestinian Israeli question doesn't uh, figure much in the popular perception in uh, Afghanistan or in Northwest Pakistan because most of them perhaps can't even locate the two places on the map. Andrea also wonders if the Voice of America's Pashto service can play any role in getting the people good information and helping change their minds. Yes, uh, it, is, it is a very potent uh, voice uh, in the Pashtun world, in certain section of the Pashtun world. And uh, yeah, it has done some good job. But then um, I believe much of the Pashto that uh, that is uh, used for, for by the Voice of America or BBC Pashto is the one uh, that is spoken in Afghanistan. And there is some slight variation of dialect. So a better, uh, you know, we in recent times, we are employing better tools. The social media offers some extraordinary opportunities. And uh, if we handle it with care and uh, back it up by some uh, openings in the electronic media, we can make a huge difference. But yes, you're right, Voice of America is one good source of uh, promoting good image of the Jewish people among the Pashtuns. Okay, one last question from her is that educators and media, politicians and clerics are the major influence for good or bad. And these sectors are anti-Semitic. So how will they be influenced to change when they are rewarded for Jew hatred? Yes. You are right in that, that uh, much of the hatred that uh, is bandied about has material basis. This is true. But then when you convey it to the common masses that accepting hate, uh, it has a cost. And the cost is devastating as we saw over the past two decades. It leads to wars, unending wars that uh, ruins communities, that almost kills the national life. and it is in nobody's interest to have another, yet another round of war and a series of rounds of wars. They would be brought around to the idea that in the interest of peace, it is important to respect and accept everyone. Number one. Number two, 
if we do some good developmental work in partnership with the Jewish people in the area, we can uh, convey to the masses that yes, hatred might uh, comes with some material, timely, short-term material benefits, but in the long run, it is this uh, developmental partnership that enables you to stand on your own feet that ensures regional stability and communal and national stability. They can be convinced by the academics. And, you know, in the academia, you're right, the scene is dominated by the wrong characters. But then there are always some good people around and they need some good networking, some good networking across faith divides, such as the Jewish people and the Muslim people. And once they act together, they can make a difference against any kind of uh, hostile elements. Rather, I wish to make a correction. I made an error. The Voice of America question was from Dr. Richard Benkin, who is the author of What is oh, Moderate Islam? I see, uh, right. Very okay. good to have we, Dr. Benkin with us. We have uh, a couple of questions from Susan Aronoff. Her first question is, are there any media that would accept stories about the Jewish experience in Afghanistan and Pakistan and would well publicize, would well publicize visit from Jews with roots in Pakistan be possible, helpful? Um, okay, like uh, as we speak of uh, the cultural conditions today, I don't think uh, too many media houses would be willing to do that. And uh, this has a reason in that, that much of the electronic and print media over the past decade and a half has gradually slipped into the Iranian interests within Pakistan. And what the people who pass for progressives in Pakistan have uh, somehow become closer to the Iranians rather than the international progressive elements. This is unfortunate. And uh, they mistakenly got caught in the Shia Sunni divide within the country. This was very unintelligent on their part. A tiny part like us, we are trying to balance these various trends. But uh, as of now, it would be a little difficult for any printing house or electronic media house to publish uh, this kind of material. But I can look for it. I can look for it, stay in touch. Let me do some research over the next uh, week to 10 days time, and uh, I shall get back to you uh, with information about any possibilities. And what was, uh, what was the second part of the question? Yes, the her other question is, she writes, you seem to be recommending focusing on the attitude towards Jews with little or no mention of Israel. Is that a tactic you feel is best? For starters, we have to go that way. I mentioned early on that begin with doable, less controversial subjects, because when you enter the realm of interstate uh, conflicts, you make th things difficult for you. First, you build the ground of opinion on less controversial issues. Once you have that uh, sufficient public opinion towards uh, certain common things, then you move on to throw in the bigger questions as well. And then it is diff that that's, then it is easier to resolve them. I have seen this after uh, viewing the Pakistani-India situation, where we had some formidable challenges and still continue to have formidable challenges in uh, building uh, uh, pluralistic and uh, accommodative opinions on both sides. So we should employ some of these <clears throat> lessons towards this Israeli question as well. Let's first build some good opinion about the Jewish people. Once uh, we have sufficient uh, sound and healthy opinion on that, then we shall move on to tell them that if Saudis and UAE and Bahrain and Uzbekistan and Turkmenistan can be friendly towards uh, Israel, why not us? We don't share any border with Israel. We don't have any dispute with Israel. but if we have good relations with Israel, we can have a bigger, bigger say in the whole region. But there has to be some kind of uh, incremental methodology to it. 
uh, so we go on building uh, some good strategies and some good tools for uh, bringing people uh, closer to each other. We have a question from a friend from Johannesburg, Tali Nates. She writes, how sensitive is the general teaching of history in Pakistan? Uh, she writes, I understand from colleagues in Pakistan, when we spoke about bringing Holocaust and genocide history to schools there, that there is suspicion of all history teaching. I wonder about your take on this. Very good to hear from you, Tali. And uh, when it comes to teaching of history, not just Pakistan, but unfortunately, most of the Middle East and Norris would agree with me, South Asia is a wasteland. What is called liberal, secular, independent history is not taught at the official level, nor even tolerated in the general academic milieu. And if you go for uh, introducing uh, abrupt changes in the academic culture, yes, that becomes self-defeating. The path has to be a gradualist where people know about uh, the limitations and uh, the amount of space that is available to them. And then they increment uh, their uh, goals and targets with the passage of time. And uh, a good way to make uh, the culture of history teaching more, uh, uh, more positive would be to encourage students to read more, even outside the classroom. My strategy is that I have some 13,000 uh, books in the soft version, in the uh, ebook format with me. I deliver my lessons in the classroom. And after that, I recommend readings. And I provide my students with those readings. And uh, those the readings that I provide are more liberal are uh, more progressive than the curriculum taught within the classroom. Yes, the history teaching is not sensitive in the area, but wherever there is a will among the academics to get around uh, the stifling uh, academic culture, they can do it. And uh, they have done it in uh, some parts in a significant way. Susan Aronoff wants to know, that if books are printed in the local languages, such as Dari, Pashto, Urdu, the languages spoken in these countries, would it have any impact? Absolutely. And if, if those that's, books are printed and also distributed for free, free of cost. Absolutely. That's that's that, that's that's the kind of uh, strategy we have to employ. This was this is going to make a great deal of difference, and I have witnessed the way Islamists in this region operate and i know i know why their project failed so miserably because uh, if you go to the mosque uh, the, the biggest mosque in cohort my city and uh, after every friday sermon these uh tablighi jamaat uh, these uh, preachers they gather and they deliver their sermons in urdu language and i can notice that as the priest is delivering the lecture in urdu language the audience sitting down there, they hardly understand 10 to 15%. And the lessons uh, that they get are totally opposite to what the preacher is saying. I mean, there is a joke, a very famous joke in the area that uh, after uh, a wazir tribe boy came of age and uh, landed in bad company, he was sent to a preacher who told him Venerable Moses, Prophet Moses' story, uh, we are in uh, Prophet Moses' so confronted magicians and defeated them. So the guy got the impression that perhaps Prophet Moses had a clash and cough gun with him. And next time he went to the street, he carried a gun with him. So it's because the local languages are well understood. Printed material in the local languages is going to make a tremendous uh, public difference in the public opinion. And this is, this is a good strategy publishing material in the local languages that depicts the Jewish people in positive lights. Thank you so much, Fawad, for answering the questions and for this most insightful analysis. We are most grateful to all those who joined us for today's session. And uh, please do join us every Thursday at 9 a.m. 
Eastern Standard Time in US and Canada, which would be 1 p.m. in the UK, 3 p.m. in Israel and South Africa. So we look forward to having you for our forthcoming sessions as well. The series would go on till the 27th of May. Now, with much gratitude for the speaker for today's session, our friend Fawad Javed, and to all those who found the time to join us today, I hand over the reins to my colleague, Mr. Ira Gubaman, to say the closing words. Thank you very much. Yeah, just thank you. Very thank much, you. Everyone. Thank you, Navraz, and thank you, Fawad. Uh, it was a wonderful session welcome. today. Uh, we'll be back uh, for our next session on uh, Thursday, April 8th in the South Asia and Comparative Perspective uh, Seminar Series, where our, our seminar series convener, uh, Dr. Navaraz Afridi, will be uh, exploring the unnoticed anti-Semitism in India. Um, so we'll see you all in uh, two weeks time then. Uh, for those of you celebrating, have a happy Passover. And uh, thanks so much again for joining us today. Take care. Take care, everyone.